Good morning all. My name is Sean Courtney and I'm the Communications Officer here at Connecting Up and TechSoup New Zealand. Thank you for joining our webinar today, Office 365 Implementation Considerations, with Matt Walton, Senior ICT Consultant at InfoExchange. Before I hand over to Matt, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you do have a question during the webinar, please type your question in the question box on your GoToWebinar panel and we'll aim to pause about halfway through uh, and at the end of the webinar as well to answer any questions that you might have. Also don't forget that a recording of the webinar and slides will be sent to you all after the webinar so you can review it any time you like. That's all from me so I'd now like to hand over to Matt. Thanks Matt. Thanks Sean and welcome everyone to today's webinar on Office 365 and what to consider when implementing. So I know all of you will be at different stages of your Office 365 journey. Some of you may be using it already, some of you may have only just heard of it. So I'm hoping to give a, a good overview and have you leaving this one hour webinar with a, a bit more of a, a stronger sense of um, whether it's right for you and also um, how you use it in your organisation because it is different for everyone. So just to give you a bit of background on InfoExchange, we are a Microsoft partner um, but more importantly we're a not-for-profit and we only work with other not-for-profits in technology. So we have been doing a lot of work in Office 365 and have been implementing all sorts of Office 365 solutions for all types of organisations. So, um, you know, you, you'll see the diversity on the screen there around very small one or two person organisation to ones with thousands of staff across the whole country So and, and internationally. So, um, what we've learned from that experience, we're hoping to give back to you in, in these type of webinars. Um, and there is a series of these webinars, so there's uh, one every fortnight I think at the moment on a, a range of topics, whether it be Office 365 or Azure or um, moving to the cloud in more generally. So hopefully um, this can help educate you and the, the sector about what products are available and, and whether they're suitable. So today uh, it is a jam-packed agenda. I'm going to try and cram as much as I can. So apologies if I if I end up going too fast for some of you. But um, what I'm trying to do today is give you a broad, a bit of an overview of the product as well for those who aren't really that familiar with Office 365 and and what's included. Um, a bit about licensing and what you get for free and and what you may have to pay for, and also, more importantly, I'm going to talk through a lot of the key applications within Office 365 and give you some tips along the way of things that um, you need to think about and things that uh, um, are, are suitable for some organisations and not others. So this is not necessarily a, a, a sales session where I'm really going to try and uh, you know, convince you of every single application. It's more just making you aware of what's available and, and giving you some tips as to what to think about um, before you implement and through the journey. So I'm hoping um, that's going to give everyone um, enough to at least get started today. And then obviously there's other future webinars on, on some more detail. So you know, we'll touch on SharePoint today, for example, but there's a whole other one-hour webinar on SharePoint. We'll touch on what to consider when migrating email, but there's do-it-yourself workshops that can actually go into a lot more detail. So um, we'll, we'll start with this today and obviously uh, um, feel free to ask questions along the way. So just starting off, what is Office 365? So essentially, it's a cloud-based platform that Microsoft um, are providing, hosting in their data centres in Sydney and Melbourne, and provides you with a suite of services and applications. And we'll spend the rest of today uh, talking about each of those applications. But some of the big ones that traditionally you have 
had to install on a server and host in your office or, or in, in your own data centre. Things like Exchange for email, SharePoint for documents and Link for video conferencing and, and, and telephony. So those are now available just as a service that Microsoft are hosting for you and providing as opposed to software that you have to buy and install and manage and maintain. So what that means is Microsoft really look after all the, the back end and all the, all the boring service stuff on your behalf. So you don't need to do maintenance, it's always up to date. So you're essentially just buying the latest version of whatever you're using. So for email, for example, you used to have to do Exchange 2007, Exchange 2010, Exchange 2013. So when I was a, an IT manager at a, at a not-for-profit, I used to have to go through that upgrade process every, every couple of years. But now, you're just always on the latest version of whatever Microsoft are, are hosting for you. So you don't even need to think about that. Um, they do guarantee the service around 99.9% .9 availability, which is generally significant higher than if you are hosting it yourself. Um, and they do look after all the security and certifications. So in comparison on, to hosting it yourself in, and storing a server in your office, generally these uh, sort of the security that are in place uh, on these platforms um, is significantly higher. And we can touch on security again later. So you also get office apps. So things like Word, Excel, PowerPoint, um, you get available as Office Online, so you get a free version of Office Online, but you can also purchase your Office 2016, so Word, Excel, PowerPoint installed on your desktop, you can get that through Office uh, 365. It is a, also a little bit confusing because you can get Office 365 a personal version, so you can go to JB Hi-Fi or Officeworks and buy Office 365, but Please remember that is a totally different product from what we're talking about today. Um, so what we're talking about is what Microsoft uh, are giving not-for-profits free. So you get what's called an E1. So the E stands for enterprise, which means that this product is the same product that people like BHP or government uh, are using. So this is an enterprise product. It's not some scaled down sort of version that uh, only not-for-profits are accessing. So we get an E1 plan for free, unlimited users and unlimited accounts. So uh, I'm not sure if I can, I, if I need to say that again, but yeah, it's, it's great that Microsoft are generously saying eligible not-for-profits and charities can have Office 365 for free with this E1 license. So you, you do get a fair bit with that free E1 license. So you get a 50 gig mailbox, which is huge. None of our clients ever fill that up. The same with a terabyte of OneDrive document storage. Um, you get the web apps, so Word Online, Excel Online. You get um, some basic uh, mobile apps. You even get phone support as well. So you can call Microsoft if something goes, goes wrong. Um, so all of these things you get as part of an E1 plan which is available for free. Now, some of you may also be confused about um, what you get for free and what you don't. So there is a whole heap of other things that you can get at a discounted rate. So the prices that I've got up on the screen there they're all not-for-profit pricing. So these are things that you can buy on top of E1 if you want to. To be honest, a lot of our clients don't buy any of these and that's okay. So you can operate on the free version, but if you want Word, Excel, PowerPoint on your desktop, you can buy it through here um, for, for $2.90 a user a month plus GST. However, if you've already got Office 2013 or 2016 on your desktop, you don't need to buy it. If you would prefer to buy it through connecting up, which is actually cheaper in the long run, 
um, for $56 as a once-off purchase that could last you up to four years, then you can do that as well. So there are a few different ways to get those licenses. Um, this $2.91 is, is just another version. The, and then from there you can scale up and there's a few different bits of functionality. Now again, some of our clients use the E3 plan which also includes that Office 2016 but it also gives you legal hold and, and some more advanced features around storing information and data if you delete it. So for example, if you, your staff delete their emails and delete their sent, sent items or delete their deleted items box, you can keep hold of that in case you ever need to come back to that and that's what legal hold is. E5 plans are a newer one that it's actually the one I use because um, I do a lot of video conferencing. So I actually have a dialing number um, similar to this go to meeting where you can phone in to Skype for business meetings. Um, and so that's, a, that's an additional cost. There's a whole heap of other things around mobility and other Microsoft products like Project and Visio. So there's some additional costs if you, if you want them. Um, but again, no obligation there to, to actually use. So you can click on that link below. Um, as Sean said, we'll send the slides out. You can click on that link and um, have a look at this pricing as well. Or if you're existing Microsoft, uh, if you're already using Office 365, you can go into your admin portal and add these licenses on. Um, and it's just a monthly cost that comes off your credit card or, or sends you an invoice. All right. So the key thing that I'm sure a lot of you will want to know is what's included in Office 365. So what do I actually get? Now, it's very complicated and large and regularly changing sort of platform. So this is one of the, the better tables that I've uh, borrowed off someone else who's, um, that I find this is the, the easiest way to explain what applications are in Office 365. Now the first thing to um, reassure you of is don't get too daunted by this because you don't need to use all of them. We've got some clients who all they use is mail for email, calendar, people and tasks and that's it and that's okay. So I'm not here to say you have to use all of these things. It's just making you aware of here are some things that are available. And for those who are already using Office 365, as you will have seen, new things appear every day. So um, we're not focusing on the roadmap and what's next in this webinar. We'll, we'll talk about that in a, in a future webinar. But um, things like Teams and Stream, they're brand new. They, they just appeared over the last uh, couple of months. Um, and they will continually build on this platform and give you new functions and features as Microsoft develop them. And also keep in mind some of these things are, are licensed separately, so you do need to pay extra um, for a couple of these things. So Dynamics 365, that's a bit of a separate implementation. Um, I use Dynamics, but most of you probably won't ever need that or, or use that or pay extra for those licenses. So um, just keep that in mind as well. So this, because it's so diverse, it's great Microsoft keep giving us extra stuff, but the challenge for not-for-profits is, well, what do I actually need? How do I test these new things? And how do I work out what products to use and what not to use because it's too new or it's not suitable? So, and, and this is where we do a lot of our work, to be honest, is, is just helping people decide which of these tools is right for them. So really the first step is not a technical step at all. It's, it's nothing to do with technology. It's trying to understand who will be using it and more importantly, why are they using it. So it could be that across your organization you have different tools for different people. So the first step is who is using the tool. 
Is it just your service delivery staff who are out working with clients? Or is it your managers that are in the office looking at uh, reporting and dashboards? Are they the ones that's using it? Because also, the who's using it, you should also consider what type of person they are, what their digital literacy levels are. Do they prefer online platforms? Are they a millennial and, and love the, the chat and social aspects of, of the online world? Or are they more a face-to-face -face person um, and, and really just want to use these online tools to access, download information occasionally and not really commit to using it all the, all the time? So these are a few of the questions we ask before people go off and start using tools. Um, because what we find as well is all of those tools and, and systems on the uh, slide before, you could implement all of them and you could tell your staff, hey, there's this new thing called Teams or, or whatever it is. Um, but unless they've got a reason to access it and use it, you're going to find that you'll have 20 different tools but no one using them. Um, and that's a common issue that we see across the not-for-profit sector. So that's why we really encourage you to take a, a slow and steady approach for understanding your requirements and how you're going to use tools before you just go off and deploy them and tell these poor support staff or poor uh, people who are out trying to spend their time working with clients and um, they don't want to have to be bombarded with all this new technology all the time. Um, so I think that's, that's a key thing to take away and to remember before we uh, go into the detail of, of each, each application. The other thing, and, and generally the first thing that we encourage people to do, is look at the business case for Office 365. Now I know a lot of not-for-profits don't want to focus on business cases. Um, and, and the money side of it, or the just, but, but really all this is is justifying why you need this, and often there is a lot of effort or, or some change in moving to a new platform. So essentially it's saying, what are the key reasons for us to use Office 365 instead of just, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. Um, and generally, these are some of the top top five essentially reasons for moving to Office 365. And it usually it helps justify that any cost or any change to do with that. So for example, if you've got a you know, three-year-old server, four-year-old server, or <laughs> we see many 10-year-old servers as well, um, if you have to go out and buy a new $10,000 server, buy some software to put on it, buy some licenses, get an IT person to install it, um, you know, then you've got to maintain it, then you've got to do backups. So all of those things add up, both from an effort and a cost perspective. So what we're saying is, in most cases, it's much cheaper to move to something like Office 365 um, than actually upgrade your server. Now, not saying no one needs servers ever, um, some of you may still need servers when moving to Office 365, but that's part of the reason um, for, for moving. And just taking away that headache. So I used, as I said, I used to be an IT manager who used to make sh have to make sure the backups were ready and the, all the um, all the servers were up and running and available 24 hours a day. Just to not have to worry about that is a is a real weight off. Um, video conferencing is another good, good example where we've seen organisations um, save a fortune in travel costs or pe flexibility of people working from home and saving office space and those sort of things by just implementing a really easy Skype for Business type solution. So that's, a, that's another sort of good reason to, um, to move to 365. Collaboration, so having an online platform means you can work from anywhere across um, multiple devices and being able to um, work together better. And that's becoming more and more important in, in the not-for-profit sector. Um, but not just working together, but just making sure that you know the single source of truth. So I know many of you will have 
different versions of different documents stored all over your, your file server and you never know which one's the, the up, most up-to-date version. So just having a, the single source of truth and, and knowing where things are is, uh, is critical. So um, what I might do, I might pause if that's all right, Sean, um, and just pause for a couple of questions. The, the next part of the webinar, I'm essentially going to go into every or most of these products I've got a slide on each of the key products and some of the things to think about. So, and then at the end, I'm also going to talk more around things like infrastructure and adoption and, and staging. So, conscious of time, I might just pause for a couple of minutes to ask the questions. In the, but if we don't do it now, we can either um, have some more questions at the end, or we can do it offline as well. Um, I'm available to. Uh, to, to get an email and, and answer that after the webinar if you prefer. Sean, any questions so far? Hey, Matt. Yeah, no worries. So I've got a few questions. And, and do let me know if uh, any of them, like you said, you are going to delve into a little bit later on and, and we can move on from those ones. So uh, we've got one from Alex who, who was just wondering around approximate cost of looking at changing over to 365. He's been quoted um, a few thousands of dollars for, for certain things. So. Are you able to discuss a little bit about that? Yeah, so I think um, going back to the, so obviously licensing is one cost, um, but regardless of the licensing costs, even if the product is free, there is often effort involved in moving. So the key one obviously is email and moving your e email from existing systems like Gmail up to Office 365. Likewise with documents. If you've got thousands of documents on your file server, usually there's a process for one, assessing that data and, and working out whether it comes across and setting up the new platform. So yes, often, often there are implementation costs. Some organisations can do it yourself and that's why we often have do-it-yourself workshops where we help organisations do it themselves. Um, to be honest, InfoExchange does help organisations all the time migrate across and yes, even though we're an off-profit, we often still charge implementation costs of our time to help people think through um, what they're going to use and when, set up the new platform and migrate the data and, and run training and those sort of things. So um, obviously I'm not sure what uh, what's in the quote for Alex's but I would look at those costs. It's the um, bit of consulting around what to use, migration of data, configuration of your new system, um, and training. And to be honest, each application is different. So what you would pay someone to help you with the email is different from documents and different from some of the others. But a lot of the ones we'll talk about today are actually easy to do yourself. So once you've got your, your tenants set up, it's actually easy to do something like Office 365 Groups or, or Planner or Yammer. Um, so I hope that that's answered. But um, also happy to, you know, if if afterwards Alex wants to share some some more detail around the quote, I'm happy to give an independent advice around. Oh yeah, that sounds reasonable or or not. Great, thank you, Matt. I've got a couple of questions actually around the plans, whether you can mix and match. So from both Nahim and and Mitzi, just so wondering whether you can um, mix the, the different plans at all. Definitely, yeah, and, and we would usually encourage that. So sorry if I didn't mention that, but um, usually we would say, by default, give everyone the free E1, but those who need Office, then you buy the add-on. So you might have 100 staff, 100 staff and volunteers and board using your E1s. You might have five staff, uh, that need Skype for Business, uh, PSGN conferencing on the E5 plan. You might have 20 staff that need a new copy of Office 2016, so you give them the, the add-on, um, but the others already have a copy on their, their uh, device, so just keep them with the free plan. So definitely we would um, encourage you to mix and match. Great, thank you, Matt. We've got another question uh, from Liz who asks, "What happens if the 50 gigabyte or and or uh, 100, oh, sorry, one terabyte limits are reached?" 
Yeah, so there are additional um, plans and storage costs that you can buy. So SharePoint's a good example where we've got a couple of clients who um, buy extra storage for SharePoint, but generally that's, that's not a common scenario because 50 gig and a terabyte are quite generous. And generally what we find is if people are using more than that, then they're probably using it in, the, in a wrong way. Um, so if you're storing more than a terabyte in your OneDrive, I would, because OneDrive is for individuals, I would encourage you to explore, well, why does that one individual store all the data and why isn't it on a central SharePoint? Or maybe you need some local storage um, or, or there's some other, other ways to do it. Likewise with the EMAR plans, an E3 plan actually gives you a 50 gig archive as well as your normal 50 gig. So if you've got a user who's using more than 50 gig, I'd probably put them on an E3 plan and then they can put 50 gig in an archive and keep 50 gig in their, in their Marbox. But. Great. Thank you, Matt. We've got another question from David who's just wondering, can a staff member say piggyback off the not-for-profit business at, uh, account and, and have their own 365 system on their own personal device at home? So yes uh, is the short answer. So you can have um, a personal account um, and I think if, if I'm hearing that question correctly it might be referring to a copy of Office. So if you buy a copy of o Office Pro Plus or an E3 plan you get Office, Word, Excel, PowerPoint. With that, each user gets five licenses that you can install on your personal devices. So I use a Windows laptop. Um, I have a copy of Office 2016 on that as part of my E5 plan. But I also have a Mac at home and I have Office for Mac installed. I have an iPhone and I, I have the mobile apps on my iPhone. I also have an iPad and I have the Office apps on my iPad. And just recently, um, I left my laptop at home, so I borrowed a spare one from work and I installed the fifth copy on a spare laptop. So I had five copies. Um, so you can use it for across multiple devices. But each of those licenses linked to my work account, my mWalton at Info Exchange. So if I ever leave Info Exchange, that Info Exchange will disable my account and that Word Excel on my Mac at home will stop working. So I wouldn't use it for personal use for, for permanent long term things, but you can do that work from home on multiple devices. Thanks, Matt. We've got a few sort of general questions around Outlooks, and so because you're going to cover that, aren't you? So perhaps shall I just uh, leave that for that section? Yeah, let's. let's uh, put those to the end if that's okay. Conscious of time, we've got still a heap yeah. more to cover. So I'm going to um, skim, skim through these and then um, I'm happy to stay late at the end or, or answer questions offline as well. Okay, All right. All right. Well, perhaps I'll hand it back over to you. Great. Thanks, Sean. So as I said, we're, we're going to sort of talk about each application um, generally both at a high level for those who, who aren't aware but also I'll get, try and give you some tips along the way. So the most common things that most not-for-profits uh, initially use Office 365 for is Exchange Online which is basically what you used to have on, a, on an Exchange server in your office. Um, it's replace, it can replace that. So most organisations now use this instead. Um, it's also sort of can replace Gmail or it's sort of the equivalent, you know, similar to Gmail or a lot of people have hosted paid hosting emails as part of their internet plans or, uh, or just paid systems. So essentially moving to Exchange will replace all of those. You do get unlimited number of mailboxes. So, you know, we've got start organisations with thousands of email accounts and you can have as many as you want with 50 gig each for staff and, and volunteers. So um, there's some sort of licensing rules around who, who counts as a volunteer. So you can't give it to everyone, but um, if board members or permanent volunteers 
um, it's, it's fine to give them a, an email account. You can also use it for shared and generic mailboxes, so those things like admin at info exchange, you can use those and give access to multiple people. You can use it for sharing resources, so things like uh, booking the, the meeting room I'm in now, I've booked uh, using our exchange calendars. Um, cars, so we've got cars that we share, pull cars, um, and devices like projectors or spare laptops we book out using the calendars as well. You also use it for storing your contacts and distribution lists and even store it centrally storing your external contacts in there as well. Um, sharing calendars across the, the organisation between staff and having different levels of permissions uh, is important as well. So as we touched on with the implementation, there is a, an effort or cost involved in migrating content across. To be honest, if you're just starting from, if you're a brand new organisation and starting from scratch, then yeah, it's pretty actually easy to set up your email in Office 365. But the hard bit for most organisations is getting all their old data from wherever it is now up into the new system. And that's where you often need help or advice from, a, from an IT company or, or a um, specialist. So we do have uh, yeah, do-it-yourself workshops and some more detail on Exchange around how to migrate, what migration approaches there are. So I won't spend too much more time on that today, but um, again, happy to ask questions offline. The other one, which again we've got a whole one-hour webinar on, is, is SharePoint. So SharePoint's a very popular one where um, organisations usually come to us and say, yep, I want an intranet. So whether it's replacing an old server-based SharePoint or a WordPress intranet or, a, um, or just no intranet at all, it's, it's a really good platform for that. And, and large organisations like NAB and, and all sorts of others use SharePoint for that purpose. But it's also good for smaller organisations as well. So many of the organisations that we work with try and use SharePoint to replace their file server. It's not always possible for all organisations to replace a file server with SharePoint, but if your needs are reasonably basic from a, and, and uh, not too big, then SharePoint can work. And it, but you need to consider that it is different from a file server. So essentially your staff will have to access information in a different way to how they used to on a file server. So don't assume you can just move it all and, and it's going to be exactly a cloud server. Um, but the great bit is, is there's some really much better functionality than say a file server around permissions, tracking versions. So every time you edit, it creates a new version and you can always go back to old versions. You can work on documents together. So regularly I work on slides or, or proposals or tenders with my colleagues and we edit the same documents at the same time. Now in addition to documents, SharePoint is also a really good uh, collaborative platform and you can do a whole heap of other things around, you could do forms and lists. Um, so I've done incident reporting, maintenance requests, leave requests, timesheets, all sorts of stuff using some basic SharePoint forms. Um, now again, it's not a HR system or it's not a really complex OH&S system, but you can do some of that basic data collection um, and, and more a, a beefed up version, an online version of Excel and database, some basic database stuff. As well as just having a spot where teams and, and projects can work together. So having a little mini internal website where you can keep track of tasks, or news or documents to do with a project or a particular team. But the important thing and the biggest uh, area where SharePoint can often fail is change management and training. So if you're, you don't bring your staff along from the journey and show them how to use these things properly, um, it, it, it can fail. Um, information architecture is important. So again, don't just take everything on your file server and dump it. On a, on a SharePoint site, look at how it's set up, look at how many folders you have, look at what you name the folders. So this is the work that I was referencing before around someone may quote you to help you with this process around information architecture and how you set up SharePoint. So that's often 
where we help organisations. But the other thing to consider it's, with SharePoint is it's not necessarily IT people that need to do this. So this is document management. Often the, the server guys aren't necessarily the right ones to, to, to run these projects. So um, obviously you need IT involved, but uh, don't assume you need a server guy to help you with a SharePoint project. Because um, it's not technical anymore, it's, it's just using an online platform. You can synchronise your SharePoint files with your local uh, PC. So I've got mine synced locally so that if I go on a plane offline, um, I can access that. Um, the functionality on SharePoint and OneDrive we'll talk about in a minute is, is much better on Office 2016. So a lot of that co-authoring and is better on Word 2016. So don't try and you, you've got Word 2010, you're not going to get all the functionality. So, so that's SharePoint as a in, in general at a high level. Um, the other thing that often confuses people is the difference between SharePoint and OneDrive because they're both tools where you can store documents in Office 365. Generally OneDrive is what we typically recommend that you treat that as an individual's working documents. So it's replacing your old desktop where people used to store their own information or their C drive or what may have been called an H drive on your server where individuals stored their information that wasn't necessarily shared. Um, but the thing with OneDrive is if that person leaves the organisation and you delete their account, all that OneDrive information is going to be deleted. So that's why we say if it's something that's important to the organisation and it needs to be shared with the rest of the team, use SharePoint as, a, as a, the general tool. But both of them can be synced offline um, and viewed through your Windows Explorer. So as I said, I might move on because, uh, yeah, and, and we can, um, I think it's in about a month there's a, there's a SharePoint webinar for a bit more detail on how to implement SharePoint. All right, the other really uh, common one that everyone is getting a lot of value out is Skype for Business. Used to be called Link. You can have links, you know, used to have it on servers. Um, and it's Skype for Business because Microsoft bought Skype and turned Link into Skype for Business. It, it, it is different from personal Skype, um, but similar functionality. And it can integrate partially with, with your personal Skype. Um, again, we encourage 2016 um, for Office, Skype comes with it. So many of you will already have Skype for Business installed on your PCs. Um, so if you have Office 365, essentially all you need to do is, is log in. Um, so it's actually really easy to implement um, if you're just using the basic functionality. Point of presence and staff messaging. So I use it most for just knowing where my team is and, and uh, chatting as opposed to a lot of formal video conferencing. Um, we do encourage you to look at stuff like headsets, um, what internet connection you're on. So we have a lot of people that try using Skype for Business and then um, complain if the quality is not great, but then they realise they're on a 3G connection with a, no speaker and no webcam and, you know, it's. It, you, you do need to consider the infrastructure that you're using this on, whether you need, you don't need a $100,000 uh, web conference set up like you, you would see in a Telstra demo centre, but um, you just do need to consider whether it's a headset or an inbuilt webcam or plugging in your cable before you jump on um, a, a video conference. As I mentioned, the E5 licence allows you that dialing number and it can also allow you a cloud PABX. So coming out later this year, um, Microsoft are still working on it with Telstra, but there are, you could essentially use Skype as a phone system. Um, and many, many of our clients do now at a hosted where you, you have a company hosting Skype for Business for you, but this is a Microsoft hosted cloud PABX that's uh, on its way. So keep an eye out for that. Yammer is another one. So again, this is another one that Microsoft bought. People call it Facebook for Business. So it's quite good for collaboration across large organisations 
and discussion. So it's not great for you know documents or anything like that. So it's not an intranet. It's more a replacing that Facebook sort of discussion. Cross team collaboration is quite good on Yammer, um, and. Uh, Many of our clients also use it for external. So you can actually set up external Yammer networks so that you, you and your partners or, or some of your clients can have discussions as well. So that's, uh, that's always a good um, thing to explore. It is integrated now, so you can tie in your groups and your permissions from across Office 365. Um, but one of the things went before you, again, just go and set up Yammer, I would encourage you to look at what you do on Yammer versus what you do on SharePoint. Because again, some of you already have intranets where you have your discussion and your news. Um, so you, you may not need Yammer. Um, but if, you, if you're going to use Yammer, then look at that change management around getting your CEO to commit to it, making sure that all of those things that used to be all staff emails now go on Yammer instead. So. You don't want to just have an empty Yammer sitting over with a couple of people using it, um, which is common from an adoption perspective uh, for some of these applications. Teams is another new, it's new, um, and you can have both a browser-based collaboration experience and a, and a local desktop. So you, there's a thing that you can install on your desktop as well. And it's really just giving your teams a place to access a lot of that information. So it is trying to be a spot where your teams would go to at the start of the day and um, do a lot of their work in, whether it's documents, whether it's chatting, whether it's one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations, um, whether it's accessing tasks in Planner or documents in, in SharePoint or notes in OneNote. So it's trying to be that hub that people go to in Teams. Again, it's probably not necessarily going to replace a high level intranet for policies and procedures, but for a team working environment, um, it's actually quite good. But again, it's new, and before you just go off and start you committing your whole organization to it, you do need to consider what you're going to do in Teams versus what you're doing in the other applications, and how to set that up, how to structure it, how, how do you define a team, how many will you have um, and how many different team areas will one individual have to access. So there's a bit of planning involved in, in that as well. But it, it is something that you know, could be worth testing for a lot of you. And groups is another one that fits in that category. Groups is something that does cut across your whole Office 365 environment. So you'll see groups in your in your Outlook or in Yammer or in Teams. So you know you our IT services team at InfoExchange uses a group, and that that manages our permissions for a lot of our documents and a lot of our discussions as well and storing information. So you can have private or public groups. I actually use this for a lot of my external communication with other clients or uh, other partners. So it's you can. Within that, have a SharePoint site or a planner or a calendar as well. So, um, again, there's there's some good functionality there, but don't assume that you you need all of these things. Planner is a project management tool, uh, a bit like Trello for some of you. That's good for some types of projects. Now, it's more suited to the agile project management style. So if a lot of you still want Gantt charts and, and those sort of very rigid, more task focus, dependency sort of focus project management, um, SharePoint project sites may be a better option. Um, so it won't, won't necessarily replace all of that, but it's a nice user-friendly tool where you can just do some basic, uh, basic task management. And again, it's integrated. When you set up a group, you get a planner with it. So um, you can use this um, just for some basic things. And again, we, we use that for some of our light projects. If you want really more detailed project management, you can buy Microsoft Project and, and integrate that with SharePoint as well. So there's, uh, there's always options which I know can be confusing. 
Flow is something that again is, is reasonably new and goes across all of Office 365 and it's a new workflow tool that allows you to transfer data either internally between Teams and SharePoint but also third party apps. So it's getting better and better at integrating with these third party apps and transferring information to Salesforce or to, to, to whatever else. Um, so we're using that for approval processes or notification or, or data transfer. So it's, again, it's not highly technical, um, but yeah, it, each of these things takes a little, little effort and research to learn. Power BI is something that everyone's getting very excited about. It's that dashboard visualization data analytics. Um, and again, it's not just Microsoft data, it obviously works with Excel and SharePoint and SQL, but it can also connect to third party applications, whether it's Salesforce or, or, or some other non-Microsoft products. Um, so we're doing a lot of work in this space, helping organisations actually display their data and give boards and management those, those really cool dashboards where they can see all their KPIs and, and client data. And, um, Cross-referencing it with uh, ABS stats or geographic data or, you know, you can merge multiple data sources. So a lot of our, our nerdy guys get really excited about this stuff. So, um, you know, that's something to explore. But again, not simple um, and not for everyone. Power Apps is another one. It, this is forms, basically. Uh, so online forms that you can use to fill out and push data into SharePoint. So, or, or a range of sources, but we're using it a lot as the front end of, of SharePoint lists where you can then, um, you know, get people to fill out a, a timesheet or, or a form or a request. Um, so again, not suitable for everything, but it's available. And last one, I know there's too many and I could have kept going all day but uh, conscious of time and, and I want to give you some more tips as well. So the last one's Dell. So again, this is across the, all of the organisation. You don't actually need to do anything to set it up, it's already there. But it's just a new cool way to um, find information. So when you're not sure where things live, whether it lives in OneDrive or SharePoint or a, a group or a team. Um, you go to Delve and it's like your profile and you can see what other people are working on. So, you know, I have a spreadsheet that I know my, uh, my manager often uses and wants me to fill out occasionally, um, but I can never remember where it's stored. So I just go to Delve, look at his profile and look at the documents he's been working on recently and I find it that way. So it's just a different way of working. Now again, a lot of the client, this might not be suitable for all of you, but um, it's there. And it's getting better at that analytics. So I get a report from this saying, okay, you've spent this many hours in meetings this week, this many hours after hours working. And so it's getting clever and, and starting to analyse and your work practices and suggest improvement. All right, so just broadly, the mobile stuff's getting, very, uh, getting better and better across all devices. So um, you actually get better apps on the iPhone now than you do on Windows Phone. So it's, it doesn't matter what type of device you have. And as we touched on before, if you buy a Pro Plus license or an E3 or an E5, you get five copies of Office on multiple devices. Um, but if you don't buy that license, you can still have some read-only apps. So the Outlook app is free for your email. The OneDrive app is free. So it's just the Word, Excel, PowerPoint, some of those apps. Um, the other thing that Office 365 does is um, mobile device management and enterprise mobility. So that's another thing where a lot of you are using iPads and out and about and you want to start managing them better, then I would, I would explore that as well. All right. So out of all of those things that we talked about, sorry if that was quick and, and uh, you know, a bit rushed, but um, here's a table that probably you can come back to. I'm not going to go into too much detail again because we've talked through most of this already, but your challenge now is to work out which one of these is most suitable for you and why. And these are some of the common uses. So the, really the purpose is where you start. 
work out what you need and then try and match it to one of the applications. So feel free to use this table uh, for your own purposes and in the next webinar, the Maximising Your Use of Office 365, we'll actually go into a bit more detail about choosing applications and information architecture and how you plan that out. So I will save that for the next webinar. Um, so as you can see there, yeah, there are a range of different apps and even, even stuff like project management, as you see, there's two or three different ways you can do project management. Uh, collaboration, there's two or three different ways. So it's, it's tricky, but it's a good problem to have, I think. It's better than not having options. So, um, but that's why, yeah, often, often you might need help. So when you're implementing these, really the challenge is getting people to use them. So yeah, you could go and implement 20 of these apps tomorrow, but the most common issue we see is, is adoption. So these are some general tips and, and none of this is rocket science, but uh, general tips around how you get your team to use it. And the first one is don't give them stuff they don't need. So just make sure it adds value to their day and, and to your organisation. And explain the benefits and why that it's important. So if you're asking staff to input data into a form, tell them what's at the other end and why they need to input that data and say, hey, look at this dashboard that your manager now sees because you're inputting this data. Um, and the other ones are, are around change management. So we have um, some many of the organisations we work with, we help to not like name the intranet and put up posters and get people excited and do lunch sessions and question and answers and get your CEO to really promote it for you. So it's, it's not just getting the IT guys to set it up, it's an organisational wide change for a lot of these tools. And making sure that they've got opportunities to learn and it's not just big formal technical training, it's one-on-one -on -one stuff where you'll train some champions in each team and they can then just sit one-on-one -on -one with people. You don't necessarily have to have IT guys come out and run the training. So um, for a lot of our clients, we, we deliver training, but for a lot of them we actually say, actually, I'll train you and then you go out and train them because it often comes better from their peers as well. Um, and staging is important so for, for adoption. So an example of staging is here. Now, again, this is, might be overcomplicated for a lot of you smaller organisations who don't need all of these different things, and, but these are some examples of steps that you could follow um, and some of the ways that you could stage which applications you use and when. It's not always possible to stage, so we have some where we move from organisations on one big platform where we have to move everything at once. So if you're moving from Google Suite or something else, it might be better just to move everything at once. But if possible, it could be good to, to stage it in this way. The other thing that you need to think about through this process is your infrastructure. So again, I wouldn't just automatically move and then realise, oh, that doesn't really work on Office 2010 and a 3G connection. So these are some of the things when we say prepare your environment, look at, okay, well, wh what copy of Office do we have on our PCs and, and should we upgrade? Are our PCs compatible? Are we still on XP and we should actually be replacing them? or moving to Windows 10. Um, do we need a local server or can this project replace our local server? Um, do we need to integrate with your current Active Directory so that everyone has the same username and password? Um, which you can do using a tool called AAD Connect as well. Um, how are we going to support this on an ongoing basis? So many organisations come to us and they've got support providers who aren't experts in Office 365 and they're, they're very server focused. So the challenge is working out, um, you know, do you need to change support providers is, is one of the other questions. Um, moving your data across and training and change management, so those ones in the top left corner, 
to be honest, they're most of the work, and that's what you may need a quote from, from a partner for. So again, use this slide before you go off and implement something, just to double check, have we thought about all these things? Do our scanners work with Office 365? Now most do, but you know, if you've got a 10-year-old uh, photocopier that, w that maybe isn't compatible with scanning. So there's a few things to check. Alright, so conscious of time, I'm going to save some time for questions. Um, so I'm just going to link you off to where you can get help as well. I know this one hour webinar is more an introduction, so it's not, you've probably still got questions. One of the things we're doing is readiness assessments. So essentially it's something you can just buy for $100 through Connecting Up and it will allow one of our consultants to work with you and give you a report to say, yes, you're ready, um, but you need to upgrade to Office 2016, you might need to upgrade your internet connection, and this is how you could migrate your email, and this is roughly what you could expect someone to quote you on. So if you wanted to compare quotes or, or get an independent advice on um, either at SharePoint or email or any of these things, um, a reading assessment's a great place to start. If you want to have a go at it yourself, so you know, basic email migration, if you're a small org and you've got 10 users, you know, there's stuff that you can do yourself and, and these are these workshops, uh, $300 workshops over webinars um, that, that we can help you uh, move across yourself if you've got some sort of skills. More webinars, so I'm running a fortnightly webinar now, so I think next one's about Microsoft Azure, but after that we're coming back to SharePoint and um, maximising your use of 365, particularly for those who are already using it a bit. Um, and yeah, there's a different webinar every, every fortnight. And we're open to new webinars as well, so if you've got some content, um, let us know, uh, or it's something you need. We do help organisations, now this isn't a, a, about us trying to sell you stuff, it's more about us trying to give you independent advice, but we do help organisations do this migration and provide support and training as well. Um, but the Microsoft website's there as well from uh, looking at licensing. And feel free to contact me if you have any, any details. So um, just following up, top tips, just use the things that add value to your organisation, spend the time considering, explain the benefits to staff, make sure your infrastructure is suitable and resource the project. So, they're our probably top tip. These are the five things that we see go wrong most often. Then it's not the technical stuff usually that's the issue, it's the change management. Um, so I might leave it there and throw open the questions, Sean. Sorry if we're uh, cutting it fine. Um, but I'm happy to hang around for 10, 15 minutes or however long for questions um, if people want them. Otherwise, yeah, my email address is, is there and phone numbers and, and LinkedIn if you need me. Sean, uh, we'll come back to those questions. Perfect, thank you Matt. Yeah, we do have a bunch of questions, some of which you may have covered to some degree, but I'll ask them anyway just in case we did have any uh, late joiners to the webinar. So we've got a question from Brett who, who's just wondering, is the Office 365 fast track planning tool available for not-for-profits that you know of? It is. It's, so that's a, an initiative that Microsoft is doing. Um, it's actually, a, there's a criteria that means that only some organisations are suitable. Um, so I think particularly large organisations, I think from memory it was 100 staff plus that was suitable. Um, and it's really, that it's just Microsoft people giving you tips along the way. So if it is something you're trying to do yourself, um, don't assume they'll come in and do everything for you. Um, so we, we have, you know, seen that some organisations get some value, some haven't. So um, it's definitely worth exploring, though, if you're a large organisation and you've had someone contact you. But there are also lots of resources online that um, can can help you. But often it's that nuance around actually knowing when not to do something. So obviously the Microsoft guys are going to try and get you to do as much as possible and use as much and buy additional licenses. Um, so you need to just 
sort of have that often an independent view can help um, or just treat treat the advice um, carefully. Great, thanks Matt. Our next question is from Jenny who's just wondering, do you recommend not activating the license on all of the apps until you're ready to deploy that particular feature? Yeah, definitely. Um, you've got to consider the change management around that. So um, particularly, you know, new things that, that will appear and that staff will, will try and jump on. Um, the platform, things like groups and teams, are actually getting easier for staff to initiate these things. So you have to be careful that uh, many times we've seen the IT people go, oh, the staff have gone off and created this stuff and I don't know what it's doing. So yes, you can turn a lot of this stuff off in the portal um, or educate your staff that, hey, if they have a requirement, come to you first before they go off and start playing with with things. So it's a fine balance. You actually do want to empower your staff to, to try new things, but do it within parameters. So, so yes is the short answer. I would encourage you to try and manage some of that change and, and new apps and only use what you need. Terrific. Thank you, Matt. Now you talked a little earlier about what happens with regards to licenses when uh, users leave the organisation. Um, but Nick was just wondering, say, can a license be reassigned from someone who's left the organisation to a new person who, who starts? And what happens to the users who have uh, left in their, their mailbox? Is, is there a copy in the cloud or does it have to be manually archived? Ar archived sorry. Yes, yeah, so the, the licences are, are very fluid. So you can just assign and unassign licenses whenever you want through the admin portal. So if someone leaves, you would just, let's say they're on an E3 license that you're paying for, you would just unassign that license and maybe just give them a free one um, and, and keep that as an archive. So you do get unlimited free E1 licenses and if you keep that user in your system with a license, all of their data in OneDrive and um, email will be kept. So many organisations actually just disable the users but keep the users in the system so that they keep that historic data. If you do feel the need to actually delete them, then you may need to go through a manual process of moving that data um, to, to another location. So it could be you have an archive area where you actually store that, that um, all those old mailboxes if you feel the need to. Not everyone needs to store old, old information as well. So yes, the, in short, you just get billed for the month that you're using those licences. So you essentially just assign and unassign as, as you go and disable um, all the accounts uh, as people leave. Great, thank you Matt. Our next question is from Christina who's just wondering, can organisations who use uh, Outlook send me a meeting request if I'm just using email exchange? Yeah, so basically Outlook is a local copy of, of Office and you can send a request and, and I think you may be referring to Outlook web access. So you can send a meeting request on the local copy of, off, of Outlook, but you can also send it for the online version. But uh, in short, yes, you can, um, you can operate probably 90% of what you need to do in Outlook Online and Word Online and Excel Online is available, in, including meeting requests. Um, so yes is the short answer and you can also send, re send meeting invites to people on Gmail or, or other external things as well. Perfect. Thank you Matt. Now, we might have one more question here so from Alex who's just wondering if we move across from Gmail which is hosting our domain name, uh, can we access the historical emails in Gmail or, or will these addresses not be found anymore? Yes, yeah, so when you migrate your email, part of the process would be that you would um, bring your domain with you 
and bring your content with you. So you would do a content migration where you would bring all your calendars, contacts, mail from Gmail across and you would change your DNS which is your domain name, so infoexchange.org. You would essentially move that from Gmail over to Office 365. So that domain would now be pointed to Office 365 so you would continue to use mwalton at infoexchange.org. So don't feel because you're moving platforms you need to actually change email addresses um, but that DNS part is often where you, you might need a technical person to, to help you change that DNS or whoever's hosting that um, can do that for you as well. Perfect. Thank you, Matt. We might finish up there for today, so, but before we do, is there anything more that you wanted to add? No, I think uh, just, yeah, thanks for uh, sitting in. It was a lot of content to try and cram into uh, to an hour. There's a lot more to say. There's a lot more features and functions and tips. Um, so I'd encourage you to keep an eye on that. Uh, I think on the slides there's a link to all the other webinars that we're doing on a fortnightly basis. Um, so yeah, feel free to register for those or contact me directly if there's something specific to your organisation that uh, that you, you need help with or if or if you want to ask Info Exchange to, to help you with any of that. So um, good luck with it all. It is a great product, um, but you do need to be careful and, and uh, do it in the, in the right way to make sure that it's, it's a success at your organisation. So um, good luck. Terrific. Well, thank you, Matt, for presenting another great webinar today. And, and as Matt said, if you do have any further questions from today's webinar, you can contact Matt at uh, his address mwalton at infoexchange.org. Also, as mentioned at the beginning, a recording of the presentation and a copy of the slides will be sent to you all in the following days, so uh, do keep a look out in your inbox. That's, uh, that's all from me, so thanks again and enjoy the rest of your day.